If you liked this episode of the Hockey IQ podcast, please leave a like, a comment, and especially review our podcast. If you truly listened all the way to the end and you're listening to this right now, you enjoyed this episode. Please go and give it a five-star review. That helps us out more than you know. Thank you so much and look forward to the next one. On the Hockey IQ podcast today, we bring on Sumit Ware. Um, super excited to have you on. You've got an interesting concept here. You're doing some coaching, uh, one on the team level, but also individual level. Uh, first off, great to have you here. Second off, um, I'm excited to get into your journey because with a name like that, I don't think you'd ever get confused with a good old Canadian boy on the prairies. <laughs> Thanks, Greg. Thanks for having me, man. Appreciate it. Heard a lot about your podcast. Excited to be on. Yeah, hopefully good things. But um, let's, let's start with the basics here. How, how did you get into hockey in the first place? Dad put me in at two years old on the ice. So from uh, Elkford, BC, small town. Um, not much not much else other than hockey and, and coal mining in that town. So. All right. So good old coal mining town. If you're not doing that, probably at the bar. If you're not in the bar, you're probably at the rink. And those are probably both connected to each other, if I had to guess. Yeah. Um, you got deer in your backyard, which is nice uh, throughout the year, <laughs> running around. Uh, lots of snow, no ice in the summer. So lots of uh, dry land training in the summer and not much, not much else to do. It's a, it's a small town. You just, you just go and play hockey, really, there. So... I'm going to take it and I could be wrong. Tell me if I am wrong, please. Um, that your parents probably didn't have a natural hockey background. So I'd be curious on how you went about like refining your own game and improving and training. Definitely had no background. My parents came from India. Dad loved the Calgary flames back then. They won the Stanley cup in 89. Obviously everybody knows McDonald, that. McDonald baby. Yeah. Uh, Theo Fleury, those kind of guys. Um, yeah, no, I I d- didn't have a background. My dad was just really passionate uh, about the sport, uh, which I'm lucky, and um, gave me pretty much all the opportunity to go and train with the right people uh, in the area. There wasn't many people, but um, I think he gave me the opportunity to go and, and go do spring hockey. Uh, we did a lot of rollerblading in the off season. Um, I, w- I was telling my guys too, that I work with now, like here in Calgary and Vancouver, I'll be like in the summers, I had all the cones out. My dad set up the cones in the driveway. We had a l- really big driveway in, in Elkford and I would go through the cones with the puck and, and then I would just shoot like all day, all night. And, um, it would be on rollerblades though. So, um, try to replicate on ice as much as we could. My dad also used to make me go backwards on my rollerblades in the streets. So like they'd always go for a walk in the evening and I would be going backwards the entire time. We'd go public skating. It was like two bucks and he would make me just go backwards the entire time. So that helped definitely helps on pivots. And then now teaching defensemen and forward, I can do both. So you're probably good at like, demonstrating and talking at the same time because you're comfortable going backwards that much. So did you end up being a defenseman? Was a forward. And then a lot of the coaches put me uh, as a D-man just because my skating was at the level. So I actually, a lot of times I would play forward and and then they would put me on defense after, you know, I put up some points. <laughs> I was pretty good back then, I think. <laughs> Yeah, that's why you're, you know, you're in the NHL these days, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if only. Uh, no, we all want to play there one day, but it's, uh, it's it, yeah, no, I think, I think the biggest thing was just making sure you train in the off seasons and, and, and put in the time. I think that was the biggest thing that like, I think my parents helped me with was just like, we just had to put in the time. And um, I think the, the, another thing was um, other sports. I was playing like, I was doing track and field, playing soccer, volleyball, all those different sports really helps with like movement, in my opinion, like movement patterns on the ice, um, being able to like have the coordination, I think is really, really important 
for, for players now too. Well, so interesting concept there. Cause there's pro- probably a ton of people that are like, you kind of need to be around it all year long. And then other people are like, yeah, you should get away from it. I think there's, there's some value to, to both. Um, but I think what you'd mentioned there is just like movement patterns and coordination, especially as you're growing up, going through puberty, having that ability to contort your body, have to recover, find balance, a um, lot of benefits there. For me, it comes down to finding coordination and just finding good posture. I feel like that's what breaks down yes. um, more so than anything. Movement patterns, yeah, you can get ingrained a little bit from just doing one sport, but a lot of times for me, it's just that posture goes and then the rest goes, the eyes go, and then you can't see anything and it's just downhill spiral. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great point. Like I think the posture piece, you see a lot of, I think I would say younger players struggle with that. Uh, And then you see like, I think the high-end players, just their ability to, control their body in different positions and then being able to control your body in different positions. You can shoot off of the left foot, the right foot on your inside edge, on your outside edge, for sure. Uh, agree with that. Yeah. And and once you have that ability to get balance and not so much balance within two feet, cause then you've got issues there. Um, you know, you got to move to move and, like the old a frame like that's bad but just like that posture and keeping everything in balance off of one leg on outside edges um it seems to be a separating factor i don't know your thoughts on that i think so i think i'm i'm a big inside edge fan uh i teach it a lot i think it's a huge um base for a player to be able to add skill in my opinion like i think you can be like really quick but then if like your inside edge is uh not there i find that it's really difficult to change direction and change speed when you need to if that makes sense to you can you dive in a little bit further on that like so think about going really quick like actually the great example was McDavid's goal on the power or yeah, on the power play on entry last night. So he's going slow and then he speeds up and then you can kind of see him actually roll his left inside edge and square up to Mikola. And then he makes the quick change of speed to the outside on him. So I think that's really important to be able to like control your speed um, with your inside edges. Yeah, I'm curious to to dive into this a little bit further because I find sometimes players that access that inside edge, they they almost miss the glide phase of their skating. So rather than being able to access both edges, they end up only being able to access that inside edge. Mm -hmm. So I want to say at least where I'm at in the big pond here, it's it's a failure in glide phase more so than anything and being able to then easily access either of those edges. And that kind of goes back earlier to our point around being able to balance on one leg rather than kind of being a little bit like Bambi where you need both inside edges, you get on a frames to to keep yourself together. Yeah. Yeah. Like I think a lot of even the work that I do now, like on the ice, like, because I, I I film everything that I do with a player. And um, a lot of times, like I'm on, like you said, on one foot when I'm teaching and then the other leg is kind of just hovering right and and it's hovering in a in a sense of when i need to change direction it helps me get back um everything together that posture together but when i'm evaluating prior to my attack let's just say i'm doing a quick attack i i, I feel i can really slow down the game with my inside edges and then as soon as i drop my other leg that's where i count my change of speed i really like that that visualization you just used the, with the word hovering so i find that players that may look like they're in the a-frame but really their edges are unloaded or deloaded and really they're like kind of hovering ready for that next drive with the leg um you know there's a lot of agility power 
and strength um, in the skating. So like the ability to deload one of those legs, even though one is working um, or even like big thing for me is like transition. Like how many times do you see players have to transition, whether it be from forward to backward or backward to forward, particularly going from backward to forward. I find a lot of players end up going on a leg and it's already straight. So really they're just rolling the edge rather than being able to access the muscle to really get a good push on that transition. They don't get into that power position. Like football is a great example. Like you get to the top of your route tree, you're supposed to be sinking down and getting low into your legs. So now you've got a boom, a burst. And I don't see a lot of that in, in hockey. Some players are good at it, but too many, it seems, especially at the younger ages where they don't have the, the strength. They're just riding edges. They're on the wrong part of it. They're not getting into an explosive posture um, or bending over and using ankles. I, I agree with that. Um, such a great point on making sure like that one leg that you're on is a loaded leg because you want to spring out and, and have that change of speed, like you said, to be able to make your next move. And if, if you don't have that posture and, and that loaded posture, it's very, very difficult to uh, make your next play. I always call that like making, make, make, make the next play. Um, I think that a lot of times when I, when I see, like, even I work with players now, I tell them get lower, get lower. I probably say it like with some players, like 15 to 20 times is, is because of, I think it goes back to my point earlier is movement, right? Like, I think that your ability to move on the ice and spring yourself from left side to right side and have that change of speed to me as a separator in the game. Like if you look at McDavid and McKinnon, their ability with their turn backs, it's not that they turn back and, and they're quick out of there. It's like their ability to like spring out of the turn back into space. That's quick enough to be able to create the separation and then be able to make the next play. Next play mentality. Always yes. think about, okay, what position am I putting myself in? And then always what's next. Cause if you ever find that point of like, I'm putting myself in a terrible spot where the next is very difficult. We got problems. Yes. So. Yes. And like the turn backs, you'll see like everybody can work on them. But when you see McDavid, McKinnon, McCarr, you'll see the change of speed out of the turn back and their ability to control the puck. I just don't think it's ever taught enough. And it's not, um, we don't, we don't present it to the kids enough of like, it's not the turn back only that that's going to give you the success in, 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 in the game. It's your ability to get out of there quick enough. And again, it goes back to the skating, the posture, um, where are you on your edges? And, and to me, like the video is important. So you can actually work on those things and identify it for the players and they can go home and, uh, continue to work on that. Oh man. So, all right. I'm going to mention one thing. and I want to go to the next um, one is just like change of speed. You mentioned it. Like everyone seems to talk about playing fast these days. And it's really not about playing fast and skating fast the entire time. There's a lot of beauty in rather than having speed, having the ability to use that speed in the change of speed, um, that, that really makes it an effective taking that asset and how do we apply it tactically to actually put that advantage in our favor. Um, and then the second piece about filming everything, uh, would love to dive down that rabbit hole a little bit because a lot of these players now they're so visual, they've been able to see themselves forever. Like when I was going through film was just becoming available for everyone other than just the pros. And first time you see it, you're like, I am terrible. I suck. And then eventually you're like, all right, I'm not that bad anymore. Um, but it comes to a point where like, especially when you're looking at the technique itself, where it needs to go subconscious. And like, for me, it's about how do we coach through feel? How do we get players to feel what this is like? Um, and obviously the, the quicker a player is able to feel something rather than, oh, I just need to get on my toes. And they're having to think about getting on their toes the quicker they're able to actually acquire the skills, which, you know, put that over a few years, you're able to acquire something a little bit faster. 
a uh, huge competitive advantage in, in many facets. But I'm curious from just like watching and coaching what you see to helping them feel it and sink it back so you can move on to the next thing quicker. Yeah, I think so I call it field based learning and, t- and teaching. I love that word because, you know, even for my practices, you know, I build a plan for a player. It never goes exactly how I want it to go because it's feel based, like you mentioned. And when when a player struggles on a certain area, like a tight turn or coming out of a turn, handling the puck out of the turn, I have to show him and he has to make the adjustment. I can't just move on to the next drill because I had the drills set up prior. Right. And I really like that point because that to me is coaching is, is having a drill and knowing how you want it to be executed. And that's where I think like, you know, for coaches, minor, even minor hockey coaches, like show the NHL video, if they're not able to uh, do the demo, like show the NHL video. So the player has an idea how, you want it executed. And so for me, as a, as a NHL performance coach, like I actually have to be able to do the skill. I, I really put an importance on that for myself so I can truly teach the player that's doing it. I think that's important. So when I have the film on the ice, like I actually do it and then I can relate back to what I'm doing and make the connection with the player. So now he has a visual of exactly what I want to see. And then he goes and does it. And when he meets needs the adjustments or changes, we can both kind of meet at the same point and go through that clip specifically of what he just did or that, that rep that he did. And he can make the adjustments or at least try to, some guys can make the adjustment very quickly. Um, but some guys take a little bit longer and that's okay. You know, like for me and yourself, like you're talking about feel like, If you just can't get it today, that's fine. Like we'll come back to it tomorrow and we'll just kind of move on to the next thing. Cause you still want to build the player up. I think is important. Like you want to build his confidence um, as much as like you want to show him. But again, he can watch the video at the end of practice and then we can kind of come back to it again at a later date. I, I like that element of like, you're teaching yourself first and then teaching the player. Like you've already had the rep of doing it yourself. Um, I know for some people it's a little bit harder than others. Um, But I think the old saying is the best way to learn is to teach and teaching yourself is a great way to do it. So that that's really, really cool. Um, And obviously do a ton of research curious of what you're researching now or what, you know, what is on top of your mind. Um, You know, a lot of people talk about, breakouts all the time uh, like for me i'm pretty hot on the, the trail of uh zone entries and how do we go about that to have more success and routes through there etc so i'm curious you know what what are you currently researching what are you currently seeing where's your your eyes leading you i'm looking at um the teams that have i would say like i, I like watching colorado for example and tampa bay so i'll i'll, I'll take elements from the season, but a lot of my NHL players that I work with, I, I I see what's happening already. So I, when I see something, when I'm watching their game, I'll clip it. It could be from any player. It could be uh, like for, for Stan Colvin, like he's plays with Wyatt, Wyatt Johnston. So like I can clip and I'll save it for a later date, but going back to that, I, I think that every player is different. And so if we want to teach zone entries of let's just say uh, drew in off Colorado for a player. I I don't want to show drew in. I, I want to see what the player is doing first. And for me, I need to break down his area of improvement first before I can show what I want him to do. That's being done in the NHL. I really try to build a picture for myself of what it should look like. And then what do I need to do with the player to help him make it into what I want it to look like? If that makes sense. So, and and that's why it's, I I talk about a player identity. I think it's important to know like who we're, who we're working with and understanding what their strengths are and how we can 
improve them individually first and then be able to kind of add the last piece of um, what what's going on in the NHL at this age and how we want to make them better. So I, I really take the individual approach first into what I want him to um, do or look like in that position. And then from there, try to build that player development model up for him. Pretty long winded, but I hope that made sense. I think we need to dive in further. I think that the key thing that I take away from what you're saying, there's a lot around player identity and player skill set because everyone's a little bit different. Something comes a little bit easier, more difficult uh, based on, you know, one God, God given uh, just, I wouldn't say talents, but just God given a, uh, framework, whatever your body's built, how it responds in certain ways, et cetera. And then obviously the ability to build that up, um, to respond better, to really work on a certain skill. You know, you can point back to Braden Point with the skating, um, you know, a million different scenarios there, but just having a good baseline identity. Because if you start wavering on your your identity itself, it's very hard to then also find confidence um, and just understanding yourself like Pat Maroon knows exactly what he is and had a long NHL career because of that and then figured out ways to adapt what his identity is for what the team needs what the coach wants um but that I find a lot of players tend to struggle with you know what is my game or they come in thinking like I'm a high scoring player and I'm like Okay, well, let's say you're going to go to Chicago in the mid 2010s and you're going to tell Patty Kane, hey, I'm a half wall guy and you're just going to walk in because that's my identity. <laughs> like, eh, and we need to change uh, the way we're thinking about that because uh, every player is different and every team has different needs. And how do you make yourself valuable day one versus maybe a few years down the road? Yeah, I think that's important understanding what your skill set is and taking a hard look at what situation are you in, right? Like, are you, are, are you going in first year in the WHL, right? I like, if I'm working with a player that's trying to make that team or is going in as a 16-year-old, you know, his identity is going to be very different than a player that's been there for two or three years. So I think it's important for him to, like, not be watching McDavid, Right. You might you might want to watch like if you're a forward you might want to watch like Arturi Lekkinen on Colorado, the way he checks, second power play, penalty killer, those are the guys that he should be watching because that's where he's going to develop the trust uh, from the coaching staff to be able to play, you know, uh, in a in a complementary role maybe for a scorer versus being the guy that he was in in Bantam hockey, right? So. I think that's a very important area that for players just, you know, we can show them McDavid and McKinnon and all those players, but I, I think that we need to make sure that we watch them first and and figure out who they are and then try to build them up um, in, into their identity um, for their next, you know, um, season, their next season or whatever position they're going into. Uh, depending on what situation they're going to be presented. I think you also hit the the nail on the head with like developing trust, like whether it be of your teammates, of your coaching staff, um, just doing the basic stuff right first before you start to nip away at other things. Um, Cause yeah, flashing flashes in the pan are good to show what you can do, but if you want to, say you're trying to make a roster for the first time, like not turning the puck over is a good, good starting point. Uh, and then add things where you can go. And I, I love how you mentioned like looking beyond the all-stars, like everyone looks to McCarr, everyone looks to McDavid, but not everyone has those gifts of like, Oh yeah, I've got that extra gear. That's just faster than everyone. Or I have that giddy up in my first three steps. It's just better than everyone. Like what do players that might be fulfilling the role or have the skill set that I'm currently at, you know, maybe I'm a slower player, but I'm big. Okay, maybe I'm looking at Greenway, uh, whoever it is, just being able to to watch that film uh, so you can understand, okay, what role are they filling? What are they doing well? What does it look like? How are they getting the trust of the coaching staff? So actually get the ice time, start getting opportunities and start nipping away because 
I, I find often um, players, they're like, I can do this. Let me just show you. And it's like, well, you need to show me so then I can actually put you in these positions. So it's that that mismatch between player and coaching staff of players saying, yeah, I got this. Just get put me in there, coach. And the coach being like, well, show me a little bit of, you know, what you can do so I have the trust that, yeah, you have the potential to do this or I know you could do this. Yes, and really good point because execution builds trust. You have to execute the play. You got to execute the one-touch play off the half wall boards to exit out of the zone and hit that center, right? I think, and then it goes back to skill development. How are you developing your skills? Are you handling a puck um, consistently throughout your day? Or are you just working out doing bench press? I tell the guys like that I work with, like, make sure you work on your hands. The game is played with a puck and a stick. So don't just be doing, you know, power skating without a puck. Like, add the puck in. Um, I think that's a big thing that I, I just find, like, players miss. Like, they'll work out. They're in great shape. And then you give them a, like a hot rim. They can't pick up the puck off the boards or they can't use their feet to be able to pick up the puck off the boards. End of the day, the game's played with the puck. So, and, and the, the puck is leads to execution and, and then your execution leads to trust with your coaches and then which leads to opportunity. I like that you're, you're saying the puck should become your best friend. Yes. But, and nothing, nothing makes me laugh harder than a team bringing up, and I'm going to put this in air quotes, power skating coach. And then they do an hour of no pucks, just straight up skating. And, you know, they get better at what you train them to do. Like a player will always get better at what you train them to do. But then as soon as like, oh, we're going to go scrimmage or we're moving on to the next thing and it's a team practice or we're doing team, you know, skills, uh, you throw a puck in there and they look like, bambi <laughs> i think i think puck centered <laughs> skating development is the way of the future for this reason alone because it's all about in relation to the puck and pressure like if you're not solving those things what what are we doing like there might be a very technical thing that a specific player needs to do but if you're doing a group like there's no reason why we shouldn't have a puck always in there yeah yeah you're right i i, I think that's funny you talk about Bambi. Um, yeah, like I think the puck is the game. To We have to pass. We have to advance the puck. And if if we're not able to handle it, then there the execution it, it just it it doesn't it doesn't lead to anything. It doesn't go to the next play, like I say. So puck protection too, right? Like, yeah, I want to work on like a player comes to me, I want to work on puck protection. Okay. The first thing I do, it, we go to edge control and puck placement. Can you handle the puck and get your eyes up within your puck protection skills? That's number one, right? So I think at the end of the day, I think we have to make sure that the players are working with the puck um, as much as we can, as much as we can. I think, you know, I think it's great to work on your stride. I think those things are important. And then having that in your back of your mind, but add the puck in as much as possible. Um, and I love how you mentioned about like picking up rims because that is always underdeveloped in everyone. Um, and, and my favorite part is like you start working on rims immediately. A player wants to like stop the puck, stop themselves rather than like doing it within movement, um, doing it with your stick. Like there's times for skating, you're going to pick it up with your skate and that's relatively easy, but like, if you can pick up a rim in movement with your stick and, you know, your hands are doing the work so your body can be in puck protection or get going to make the next play, you know, that adjustment we talked about earlier with the movement patterns, like, that is unbelievably massive. I mean, I, I remember hearing about uh, Kutrov doing just picking up rims for like weeks on end, basically. And that was it just himself finding ways to pick up the puck and it shows like, how quick he's able to get a puck off a wall, one touch it or two touch it. Like it's unbelievable. And that is a competitive advantage. that's made him a few million, you know, many millions of dollars um, just based on being able to solve pressure and 
having that control of the puck. So I, I love that. I'm curious within your sessions at uh, Lab 9 with uh, your, your stable of guys. I won't go into names unless you want to, um, you know, confidentiality, et cetera. But curious what some of your sessions look like, especially when you're doing, you know, one person out there or maybe you're doing three people out there at a time. Yeah. So the first thing is I got to go through the player video. I have to understand at least a minimum of five games uh, dependent on the player. Um, for the NHL guys, it can go up to 70, 70 to 80 games that I do with them because it's a, I think it's very important for me to make sure I provide the best training for them, um, especially in the off season coming up here. But I think understanding what the player is doing and then developing a presentation for myself first so I can build the right drills that are going to impact his ability to improve. That, that That's my role. Like as much as, you know, I, I'd love a more stable uh, amount of players. I, I would love to have, you know, 10 to 15 more players. I, I, I my job is a, as a coach is to make him better. So I need to watch as much film as I can of the player to develop an understanding of what his posture is like, which, which we talked about. How's his skating ability? Can he handle the puck? Does he have a backhand deficiency? I think that's a big one I see a lot uh, of players, you know, like their ability to just catch a pass on the backhand. Like if, if that's, it goes back to puck skills. If he can't pick up the backhand pass, then he's never going to have the puck on his stick. He's going to lose the puck. So how can I work on entries when he can't get the backhand pass? So I think for me, it, that's where the, the, the starting point is. And then I'll categorize which area of the ice he's getting his touches. What are the high frequency events? You know, um, is he shooting off a certain part of the ice a lot? Um, is he picking up um, his rims um, in, a, in a specific area where you know, he picks it up and he's blinding himself to it, especially as a defenseman, I think going back for a puck. So the presentation is built, then it's communicated to the player. So I'll send it to the player and, and give him my thoughts of like what I think he should improve on. And then he will listen to it and then we'll get on the ice. So now we're on the same page and he'll probably come up with a couple of things like, Hey, Smeet, I was thinking this. And then I'll, I'll be like, okay, yep, we can work on that. We can add that in our sessions. And then we get on the ice and, and I think every drill is connected to the player now because the drill that I've made is connected to the video that he's already watched. And, and he's, he's already, um, I guess, experienced the situation during the season before. And so from there to me is like how we can make these players better, quicker and faster, and they can make the necessary adjustments in real time and then be able to take that into the rest of the offseason and continue to improve on the areas that, you know, we've identified together. I love that personalization. Um, I know plenty of guys that work in the NHL where they do the same stuff, no matter what level or what group of players. And it's unbelievable to me. Um, I'm not going to name games here, but there's a shooting coach out there. Um, and I think he has six drills in his arsenal and I've never seen or heard him do anything beyond that. And everyone I I've talked to about this says the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, and it's amazing that, you know, people are, are doing that. Cause like you mentioned, like everyone's a little bit different where they get the, their pucks, how they get their pucks, um, what areas of the ice, what weaknesses we have are, are so individualistic. And yeah, even in a group environment, you need to have some semblance where we're working the group, but also there are elements um, for that specific player. Like you're, you're doing a progression of drills or you're doing a certain set of activities, but you're almost gearing it towards like this one player. And then every single player can get their thing while tying it back into, okay, what does this look like for me? What kind of areas am I operating into? How do I maybe do a branch? Like I'm setting a route where I'm putting the defense in a spot where they have to answer a question. And based on how they answer, I've got two solutions ready. I just have to choose the one based on what you give me. Um, it's, it's amazing. And I, I love that, that individualistic and then 
sending them stuff ahead of time. I feel like not enough coaches do that. Like they're almost scared to do that. Um, I think more information, the better. I don't know. Really, what, what do you think? Yeah, I think the player, I only have, we only have one hour of ice or hour and a half, depending on how much time you have with the player. So I think the information, like every player that I've sent it to, you know, I've been doing this for five years now. They, they want it. They want it. You, they want to make the connection. They want to see what they they've done before. Um, and I think it just, it just maximizes our time together, uh, saves time uh, on the ice. Saving time, deeper connections, win-win there. Love that. Um, I'm, I'm curious to dive into one specific piece here about like, where are you getting your touches? Can you dive in a little bit further of what that looks like? Where a player is getting his touches? Yeah, yeah. You mentioned that as like one of the areas that you're looking at as you're doing your research and watching video. Yeah, so I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, like, you know, a, a, an offensive defenseman uh, might be getting, you know, a lot of touches on the backside in the offensive zone because he's um, trying to d- drive that backside dot line. So knowing how many t- how many games we've done, maybe he's touched it there. You know, if we did – let's just say we did five games he's maybe touched it 10 times on that backside so that's a high frequency event touch right um another one could be a defenseman on the weak side and the strong side defenseman is trying to hold up the four check they the opposition has dumped the puck in and now the weak side defenseman is coming um to the corner to pick up that dump so now what are your options? What are your decisions? I think just understanding those areas of the ice, um, how many times that defenseman's going there is uh that's how you can develop the right drills, right? And the right I would say like how however much time you want to put in, like on that area for that player is is important. And it again, it I think it ties to their system too. So I think if the coaches want certain things from the from the defenseman if he wants that defenseman coming rushing across um i think you know finding those high frequency events ties to the coach's system and i think it ties to the player identity yeah and also i think it helps with like route planning. like as a player you kind of understand where you're going in on the ice as well um so you can understand the situations the spots and just connect chemistry, but also um, be that reliable person for your teammates. And I love that example you're saying about like understanding where you're getting your puck touches, because it now helps you understand the situations that you're in and what information are we picking up? Where might we be lacking? What execution are we struggling with versus what we're really good at and being able to, to, to knock that out. So that that's really cool. I'm curious from like, seeing players go up you've been doing this for some time now like how do you see that progression going um let's start with like it within the season itself and then we'll kind of go talking from like age 15 all the way up to the nhl so starting on the season like what is that developing a player through the season versus yeah i think i always look at a player they're they're a different project so every player, depending on their situation, uh, going into their their season, I think that that has its own customization. Um, but I think to give you an example of like throughout the season, I think like a player could progress. I would say most of the time, I think they progress. Like I think I really, it depends on the player, but I really hold them accountable to their actions on the ice. And so that's why my, my work is very specialized because the players that come to me, they, they, they truly want to improve and get better. And so that, that's a big area for me is like finding the right fit, a player um, to work with. But I think the progression throughout the season for a player itself is just for them is understanding um, some of the video that, that, that they're getting from me is, is making sure that they're adjusting and improving on the clips 
as the season progresses. And which the cool thing is, is with what I do is, is I'm logging all those instances. And I, I, I really truly believe that when you're teaching these players, for example, um, getting the puck off the half wall from your defenseman and exiting and hitting the center, like that play will improve if we present it to them. The players need to be presented with teaching points consistently throughout the season to improve on those points. And so that's why I believe that players improve through this process. Hope that so there, question. Yeah, no, I like that. So the players, I mean, obviously there, there's many details he went into here, but the one I'm going to just pull out um, is basically players improve on what we present on what we hold them accountable to the details that we're talking about um, that, whether it be how you get a puck off the, the end wall and find the center uh, working through triangles, working through just like a, a passing progression. Like, you know, you're going into a situation pretty regularly, like, where are you looking first? Are you looking outside in? Are you looking long, short, just kind of like a, a NFL quarterback. Um, and you know what what gets measured ends up being what gets uh, altered, adjusted, and what ends up being improved. So I, I love that we're talking about being specific, presenting them with stuff, um, and then once we do that, making sure that we're not quickly falling off of it, but also staying true to it. Um, and then there are times where you get to drop it off and making sure we're coming back to that just to make sure we're keeping our standards high, especially like the NHL level. Um, there's an element of teaching, but a lot of it is just ensuring standards stay high and the details are keyed in on, um, uh, through a long season. Yeah. Yeah. I think like you hit the nail on the head in that, like just making sure like not everybody's perfect, but I think if, if, if somebody can present to me like, Hey, Samit, like you had, you had three similar instances on the, on the wall. You didn't get the puck out. Right. Like just knowing that and then seeing the video, I'll get better tomorrow because I'm going to have that in my brain. I'm going to focus on that. Or I might work on a little bit of a drill right after practice. And that's another thing that I provide to other players is here's a drill that I'd like you to work on this week. And I love that you're able to do it for, from so far away. Like there's so many benefits to actually not being in the same location as the player. Now there are times where you want to be in the same room or on the same rink, but like, for example, say you're in Western Canada, having players on the East coast is great. Like they're finishing up their game. You're able to grab it and have it for them available that next morning. Or if a player's over in Europe, you're able to, cut the film, go through it and have it available when they wake up in the morning, like a lot of benefits to that. And then also of like, here, try this out, check it out. Something where they have to make it their own. Obviously it takes a certain player that has that drive yes. um, to mess around with it rather than just doing it exactly like you tell them to do it. Um, that's another story. We, <laughs> a, 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 we can go a ways away down that pipeline of like personalities that lend themselves to, to improvement. Uh, for example, stubbornness is actually a pretty good trait to have if you're looking to go to the highest levels. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. But, but I, I, yeah, <laughs> I'm mean, I'm laughing because I got a few players I'm thinking of right now. Um, but I, I just love how like you don't have to be there anymore. Like it used to be you, you basically, I mean, every town it seemed like in Canada had one player that came back home after many years away, no matter how small the town. And there's an NHL guy that was there who could show you the ropes. Now you, you could be over in Hong Kong. You could be in Africa. You could be Australia. You, you can go to all these crazy places where you wouldn't like normally think hockey and you can get world-class coaching no matter where you're at, whether it be from resources you find online or people you find uh, online to go to. And obviously uh, there are so many benefits to it. Yeah, like I think it's great for in season because there's so many games. And the other thing too, like like I'm a head coach myself and, you know, coming up this fall with the Delta Hockey Academy here. And like as a head coach, you're, you're really busy. And I think it's very difficult to have an indiv individualized uh, feedback loop, if you want to call it, to each player and then being able to send their clips from the game prior. I think for as a head coach, it's, you're really kind of focusing on the team aspect. And so 
I, I, I find like, yes, I think what I, what I do and what you do as well. Like, I think just the ability to be able to um, provide um, development to players during the season with such a long season, I think it just gives another um, area where they can just focus on other than thinking about, you know, the game or how they played. Like, it's just like, okay, here, here's something, here's a drill where I can focus on and, and it's very specific to them. You know, I think that's the big thing that um, I think the players really like. They like that individualized plan and the individualized uh, attention that they get. Beautiful. All right. So that's within the season itself. Uh, let's talk about developing over the, the course of years. You know, you've seen players start at age 15. Um, you know, you have a player that's coming up right now for the NHL draft. You've had players you've been with a little bit longer. Like, what does that look like as you've seen players go through the ages? Yeah, it's, it's, um, I, like I, I said, every player is different. Their mindsets, the ones that I have, are very similar. The mindset is like, I just want to improve. And I think that is the similarity amongst the players that get to that next level. Um, athleticism is a big one. I think a lot of the players that are that are really good at a young age are athletic and in some ways i find that they're a little bit more physically developed than their peers which gives a little bit of an advantage i think um going into you know their class uh, amongst their peers um in terms of skill development i think that your ability to identify the areas at a young age and be able to continuously fine tune things at a younger age gives them the best chance to operate at a high level when they get to the NHL, because the margin of error is so small that having them at a younger age allows them to understand that my margin of error is going to be less next year and the year after and the year after. So they just work that much harder. I thought I, I feel. And a lot of the players that, you know, like got three going into the draft coming up here, their execution level is almost at 90% on every drill. You know, I want to hit that 90% mark because that to me is, is transferable into a game. And, um, you know, you throw trenches at them and stuff, but they just have this uh, mindset um, that really, to me, is the similarity amongst the ones that advance to that highest level. So I did a study of just like puck touches. And this is just high school players in the state of Ohio. And was just looking at, okay, what does the top line, second line, third line look like? Um, just from like a putt touch, like what do they do? How do they do it? And like top line guy, they were about 80% of their puck touches went from good to great, or at least good to good, no turnovers, things like that, or making the condition worse. Um, second line was like 60. Fourth line was dropping around 50%, depending on the, if you're playing a, 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 a team that's a little bit worse than you, it's usually going to, run around 55 a little bit worse somewhere somewhere around 40 45 and then fourth line just gets caved um i'm curious if you've done anything like that because i'm assuming it's similar to your idea of around 90 percent um because obviously if you're, if you're your percentage of success i mean it depends on your role a little bit as well like higher up the lineup you can have a little more uh freedom to try things but like if you're not trying enough you might have too much success per se how do you help expand a horizon of a player? Because I find from what, when I've done scouting work for, for teams and players, it's like if you're not trying something and failing a little bit where it kind of gives a little bit of pause of question of like, hey, I don't know about this player being able to do it. Yeah. That's good. If they're not trying it, that's a problem. It shows like they've kind of capped out a little bit of where they're at. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think, I think, for sure. Like that 90% is, 
is is more for for like uh more of a like a like a drill right in the game that 90 percent goes down to could be 70 right um but i think just making sure like to me it ties to focus where it separates the elite from the average and I was just at the rink today and I see the focus. I can already see at a young age, about six or seven years old. After my practice, I saw some kids, the kid that's dialed on the passing drill versus the kid that's just standing there kind of like puts a stick down when the puck comes, I think is a major, major factor in why a player is an elite player at 14, 15, because they're just focus is second nature to the game. I, I, I truly believe that. I think that is one area where it's just not talked about a, enough. Intensity and focus are my big, big key philosophies in, in coaching. I, I, I think working with some of the NHL players that I work with now, their intensity and focus is unbelievable when they're at practice. And then when you go to even a junior hockey practice, maybe... 60 percent of those players are like that maybe less so i think that's a, that's a big one are you ready to practice are you ready for that touch i don't think it's there enough for players and then if you're not ready you're going to miss the puck you're not going to execute your pass and then that just compiles over time and years yeah and if you're dialed in you're picking up details like you're you're mastering the basics of the activity or drill to the point where you're now starting to add your own spin and be creative within it um and just figure out things beyond the person just kind of going through the motions a little bit and just yes. trying to do the drill per se that's yeah. that's for me as a coach like if i can not execute and show them in at least one or two reps right like then I'm wasting time. So I have to have that focus and energy, my detail to the puck or what skill I'm going to present to them on the ice has to be dialed. And it takes a lot out of you, you know, like after my sessions, like could be three or four, like I'm exhausted because of how much detail and energy and focus I have to put in. So a player is, does the same thing. You know, they must do the same thing. Beautiful. Um, how should players watch film? Great question. Hmm. I think they should watch their touches and understand if they left the puck in a better position than when they found it for their teammate. That's probably okay. the best, best, easiest, simplest way I can think of so when you get the puck did you manage it or did you throw it away what instance occurred because you touched the puck i think that's a really good way for a player to watch his film and identify if you did a good thing or where you can where you can get better how, how can you evaluate your game did you leave the puck in a better position for your team i like that um, especially for on the puck. What about off the puck? Like I find myself when if I'm doing film with players, asking about where was their attention, where was their focus, like what basically what was on their radar of threats that needed to be handled and managed. Off the puck, how how I think a player and it depends on the coach's system, for one, is does he want the slash coming across, right? On the breakout, or does he want the winger to continue to push up. I think that that's important. Um, I, like for a player individually, I, I, I just think like, are you in a ready position? Are you ready to change speeds? Are you ready to work off the puck? You know, like those are some things that I think players should watch. Are you ready to work off the puck when the puck is transitioned up the ice. 
I'm going to take that as like off the puck. You're looking, am I positionally sound and am I ready for the next action, whether that be defensively or offensively being involved or handling threats? Does that simplify yes. it down? Correct. Yeah. Or am I off? No, that's, I, I think is exactly right. Beautiful. All right. And then lastly, like how should a player watch film of say NHL players, you know, I feel like most people watch NHL players. For me, I'm like McDavid's a little. You can you can pick things up from McDavid. He's on a different level than most players. Maybe not the best person to watch, but like, how would you just generally watch? You're watching specific players, specific situations. Like, how would you recommend players go about watching others? I think they should pick a player that's similar to their style, um, based on what their coach thinks. That'd be a really good one. I think, you know. I don't think it's useful to be a defenseman watching McDavid. I just don't think like there's anything that's you're not going to get the most out of your time. Right. So you want to try to find somebody that's similar to your style of game and break down the areas of the game. Like, like for example, the amount the amount of times a defenseman crosses over defending the rush is very minimal now, very minimal. Only sometimes they they need the crossover, but I think those are areas that defense like a defenseman can can watch is what are they doing away from the puck? Um, how are they defending? What stick position? Where where is the arm coming across? Where is their stick position? And that's where I think like you know having that coach can really help a player identify some of those areas. You know, I think that's, um, that's where I think uh, like with my company, I can assist with that for a player because end of the day, these, the, the kids are, you know, they, they try to watch. And I think just picking out the details can be sometimes a little bit difficult for them because they're watching the puck so much. So I think just watching maybe away from the puck could be, more beneficial than when they have it because when they have it typically like a Ford might only get 13 touches to 20 touches. And then a D man gets a little bit more, maybe 30 to 40 touches. So, you know, I think you got to just pick your points, pick, pick an area of the ice. If you want to pick defending the rush, then then just watch how the movement patterns are created. Uh, the positional patterns, um, I think pick one or two things and and really try to focus on that and learn. It's just like studying a book, right? So just try to study, take notes, and then find patterns. Find patterns. Figure out what's high frequency, what you've seen a lot, and do it well. Love it. All right. Uh, kept this going long enough here. Is there anything else that we should touch on here? But I think we got into a lot of fun areas. I really enjoyed this. Yeah, no, it was great. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Um, I sometimes give you long-winded answers because my brain is, like I said, always at the rink. So <laughs> there's a lot of context that we need to fill in on these things. It's not simple black and white like everyone thinks. Yeah. Tell me about it. I was working with a player today and we were just working on a short bump play off the boards. And it was like the amount of time and adjustments we made with him. It was, it was a lot. And he even came off the ice like, wow, I learned a lot today about myself. So like you said, there's always the detail within the detail. Know thyself. It's also a good little quote there. I love that. Detail within the detail. Uh, Sumit, again, fantastic. Thanks for uh, coming on. Where can the people find you? www.lab9.ca and you can follow us on Instagram and YouTube. I think those are the top three platforms. Beautiful. Thanks for coming on. Thank you so much, Greg. Appreciate it. That was awesome. That concludes this week's episode. Thanks for joining us here at Hockey IQ. If you haven't already, take a quick moment to hit that subscribe button, give us a thumbs up, and drop a review. 
If you want to be a great teammate, even recommend us to a friend. You can follow us at Hockey's Arsenal on Twitter and Instagram. Check out the website, hockeysarsenal.com, where you can subscribe to the weekly newsletter. You won't regret it. Catch a Buttes here next week for a brand new episode.